Welcome to the EV Sales and Marketing Strategy Session. I'm joined by really an incredible panel of people. I've got Elena Ciccatelli, whose podcast EVs for Everyone, spoiler alert, it's about EVs. Um, she speaks, speaks to people about EVs and really takes a deep dive and, and has conversations with some very interesting people. I highly recommend you listen. We've also got Liza Borges, the president of Carter Myers Automotive Group based in Virginia. Liza, welcome to you as well. And Liza is uh, one of the most forward-thinking, people-first, people-forward organizations of any kind, not just auto I've ever met. Diana Lee is the president and CEO of Constellation. Uh, Again, Diana, I want to make sure. So I always know Hello Constellation, but it used to be Constellation Social Media Agency, and now it's... Now it's just Constellation Software, Inc. Uh, that's there we go. Yes. All right. And and that's an important thing to note because uh, what started as an agency really has evolved into uh, some of the most uh, incredible and, and um, technologically advanced software uh, for social. If you want to master social, proliferate social content and hyper-localize social content. And then we've got Ash Zaki, who is the CEO an owner of Euro Motor Cars Auto Group out in the Great Bear area. And uh, I want to welcome you all and thank you for joining. Thank you. So all, thank you. all we have to do in the next 30 minutes or so, maybe a little more, <laughs> is to solve the biggest challenges for automobile dealers. We They've got this fantastic new array of 50-something models, which is soon to be 100 in the next uh, year or so of different EV models that are proliferating like buddies at this point. And they are not, EVs are not he uh, coming, they're here. Um, and customers seem to be fascinated. Yes, we hear some negative things about EVs and we hear some really positive things. But the fact remains is that they are going to become a bigger and bigger part of retail automotive going forward. So First and, foremost, first and foremost, I would love to ask the question, what makes this audience different? You know, do they shop different? Do they have different expectations? What do you think, Liza? Well, obviously there are differences in an EV buyer versus an ICE buyer because of the difference in the product that they're looking for. But when we think about the reasons that people walk into our dealerships or come online or chat, text, and email with us, they're trying to find solutions to their transportation needs. And some of them are choosing the path of going down an EV journey, some are not. But our job, regardless of what product they're looking for, is to ask really great questions so that we can help them down the right path for them and for their family, both from a budget perspective, an ease of whether it be refueling or recharging, um, understanding what sort of even wraparound products they might need to protect their vehicle. So it's not that different of a customer, but we seem to be taking it as an EV buyer needs a different path. It's the same path. It's the questions that we ask that have to be different. So I can, you know, can I ask you one? Sure, go ahead. Just really one question because it's interesting. You know, in the past for decades, you have a customer come in and you might not think twice about switching them from new to used, used to new, crossover to SUV or whatever. Um, what's your thoughts on if somebody comes in looking for an EV and somebody's not comfortable selling EVs and they, you know, to your point, don't ask the right questions, don't listen, and they try to switch them from an EV to an ICE vehicle? Right. So there's two answers to that. First, uh, within our uh, 23 stores, we do have EV champions in every store. We've gone through specific training with Plugstar, uh, Plug in America. Uh, they go on monthly calls with Bev Everything to be learning everything new that we need to uh, be aware of when talking to an EV customer. So we do try to direct uh, the customer who's looking specifically for an EV to someone that we feel is going to be knowledgeable to have those discussions. But the other piece of it that I would I would venture to say uh, is slightly different is a lot of people who are thinking about an EV journey are not necessarily coming into the dealership because they aren't ready to buy yet. They're just doing some investigating. And we have certainly learned that the best place to connect with this buyer, something that we would love to say we do with all buyers, but I think is more specific to EV, is meeting them out in the community, whether it be at Electrify America, uh, Ride and Drives, whether it be holding one ourselves, whether it be uh, able to have EVs out in an event. They want to experience them 
before they even get to the point of wanting to connect with a dealership or a sales associate? Um, okay. I, I, first and foremost, wow. Um, the fact that you have champions in every store, I, I, I think that's a rarity. Secondly, the fact that you have a total commitment to them getting up leveled in terms of knowledge, uh, is brilliant as well, because I think like any buyer, you want, so, you want to deal with somebody who kind of thinks like you do, uh, cares about what you care about and shares your passion. Ash, I'm, I'm, I'm curious from your perspective. Um, I've, it seems to me that EV buyers, like if, if you walk up to an EV buyer, and you say something negative uh, about their car or about EVs in general, it's almost like you offended a family member. They seem to have an elevated level of passion for their product versus a traditional ICE vehicle. Do you see that at all within the Mercedes line? Um, so I would say we did, David. And um, maybe two or three years ago, maybe. That was probably um, um, the reality of the situation, right? Uh, but over the last couple of years, um, first of all, we sell more than 50% of our new cars are EVs. Wow. Okay, so we sell a lot of EVs, wow. and and um, and 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 they fall in three categories, I believe. Right, the customers are right. That was the ones that one hundred percent EV. This is what I really want. Uh, I didn't know Mercedes Benz had an EV, right? And um, but I heard and tell me about them, and you know we we have a good selection of models. We have five different models of EVs. Um, and the uh, pricing obviously is anywhere from, let's say, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars for the EQB, all the way up to almost well over two hundred now is the is the EQS my box. Sorry, I forgot about that model. There's six of them now. So, so, so there's definitely a wide range of um, consumers and budgets per se. Um, a, a big percentage are previous Mercedes Benz customers that may have had an E-Class or a GLE or or something along those lines or a C-Class. And um, believe it or not, because of the aggressive nature of the marketing of EVs um, and the change in their marketplace on lease payments, actually sometimes well, the one that makes the most sense financially is to go on a lease on an EV. Right. Maybe, maybe may, because... Um, if you were to look at an ICE in an E-Class um, model versus an EQE, your payment is a lot is is less on the EV. So, Interesting. and um, and we're definitely seeing a lot of leases, maybe over ninety, probably over ninety eight percent of leases, um, for two reasons. Number one, uh, Mercedes Benz, for instance, and Audi. In that case, I also have an Audi dealership. Are subsidizing the um, the seventy five. Well, they qualify for the seventy five hundred dollar federal credit, right? Even though the cars are not really quote unquote built, but because leasing falls on that category, so so that works. And um, and they're also trying to subsidize the, the models. Sometimes some more than others, more aggressive on some versus others. So 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 we we end up with this um, big drive for leases, and we're there. Okay, um, and the the customers themselves, um, I heard you say, should you should be marketing for them separately than and so forth and so on. I don't think a dealer can really afford to market all the different EVs, but definitely being in the community, attending some some of the local community maybe car shows or car related shows especially for brands that consumers don't really know that they have an EV, right? Like Mercedes-Benz, even though they had like six models now. And over the last couple of years, we've attended a lot of those uh, events, local events and EV events and so forth and so on. So that helped a lot. So um, can I ask you a question? Do, do you yeah. said 50% of your sales are EVs. Is that common in your area? Or do you say that your store is actually leaning in more on EVs than most? No, we in our area in the Bay Area, you're probably looking somewhere between forty to sixty percent. We try to wow. hold back a little bit. Yeah, so some people are even more aggressive. And wow. uh, 
Yeah. So we're trying, we're, we're trying to make sure that uh, we don't go um, too far down that road per se. Uh, and, uh, and obviously, you're, it's important I call out that you're in California, which is <laughs> is a little bit more forward leaning and prone to EVs than, say, South Dakota, uh, for example, or Wyoming. Uh, sure. So you're definitely in a heavy EV market, and your state is really kind of promotes that way as well, right? Uh, it does, it does, uh, which is leading us to a different challenge. To be honest with you, because the amount of EVs being sold in California is 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 highlighting or pointing out the lack of the charging network. Okay, mm. so a lot of people in California and the reliability of the charging network. That's probably the biggest thing is most charging stations, a uh, big number of them are in, uh, inoperable, right? So, and whether it's because P, um, previous consumers had left the cable down or or they're just not working right or they're just not delivering the right amount of, um, of uh, wattage per se. Uh, of yeah. Power I saw a report, I saw a report just today that 50% uh, were, it, it's not uncommon, 50% of, of char- public chargers are inoperable. Um, and, and before I jump over to um, Diana, to you and Elena, guys, I want to jump back over to you for a second. So we're hearing in the West Coast, 50 to 60 percent. You're in Virginia, but you've got dealerships, 23 different dealerships um, in the area. W- what are you seeing in terms of per- percentage? Like focusing on your stores that have EVs, of course. Right. Um, nowhere near 50 to 60. <laughs> okay. We are... Uh... I think even our best store is at like 10%. Wow. Uh, and Which is above know, the national average. Yeah, we have a couple stores above the national average. But um, so we're across Virginia. We focus on what we call medium-sized markets, not metro markets, a point uh, market that has anywhere from one to three. I think our largest market has four points of, of the same brand. So not major metros. And even just in within one state, we'll go from one market um, – Actually, I take that back. Charlottesville's higher than 10%, but barely. So let's say 12% to a market like um, rural, like Stanton, Virginia, that almost is at 0%. Wow. And and I say 0% for selling in their market. They'll sell a handful into Charlottesville or into other markets, but we have very few takers uh, in their markets to purchase who live in that market. So um, even within one state, it's it varies pretty significantly. And our best store at, at most is, you know, 12, 13%. Great. I want to jump over to Diana. Thank you, Liza. Diana, you know, all you do is, is help dealers. You, you, you and your team work to help dealers figure out how do I get more traffic? How do I do a better job, more effective job at connecting with, resonating with, reaching people on a very authentic level? Is that fair? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, I'm just curious, what have you guys seen? What have you experienced through your dealers with respect to marketing to ports, EVs, EV models specifically versus uh, traditional conventional vehicles? I think, um, David, there's a lot of changes right now. And as you and I have discussed in the past, um, you know, some of the key numbers that have come up in our discussions is we know that the price of vehicles have gone up significantly because of electric vehicles. They're up over $10,000 per car. The average household that you've educated me in in the past that used to be able to afford an ICE vehicle has now dropped to, I believe you had mentioned 22%, right? Before it went from like close to 38% and now we're like closer to 22% of uh, consumer markets that can actually afford a vehicle. And most of this is all being driven by the price of electric vehicles, the amount of inventory that currently is mounting on the ground, and the amount of aging inventory that's happening in dealerships because of electric vehicles and even more electric vehicles that are about to enter the market. Um, some of the key things that have happened right now recently is just Fisker has announced just last week alone um, that they are going to a dealership model. And, you know, even though I have not spoken to Fisker about this, my presumption is that it's because it's very expensive in order to have a direct consumer model through electric vehicles, right? And 
Um, BYD was a company that we also worked with, which is an electric car maker, actually the largest in the world, uh, beating Tesla in some of the markets, have launched everywhere, Europe, Latin America, and all of these other areas. They're just not launching in the U.S., and mainly because you know of the Chinese-U.S. relations currently. Um, Sony Honda is launching a vehicle here in the U.S., the Apila, right? And I've been in conversations with them. But between all of everything that's happened recently, it's not necessarily the dealers that I'm speaking to anymore about this. It's the OEMs. And it's their drive of design, this, deciding to really push even harder to grab that EV market from Tesla here in the U.S., so whether I speak to some of the automakers and they're launching initiatives all the way co countrywide for all of their franchises representing electric vehicles, they are, you know, spending a ton of marketing dollars in order to grab as much market share in the EV market for dealers right now than I've ever seen in the history of ever doing this. You're not even putting in any type of campaigning on ICE vehicles, the money's going towards EV, EV libraries, EV representation, EV offers, but it's going there. I, mean, I, I can't say I'm surprised, honestly. I'm guessing that you guys, um, the rest of the panel, really wouldn't be surprised when you consider the billions and billions and billions of dollars that are being invested. And this is the direction that we're going. It would make sense that they have to do something and they want to do something, A, that's going to promote or accelerate getting a, an ROI, increase awareness, and hopefully spurn uh, a greater percentage of sales. I mean, for whatever it's worth <clears throat> and for whatever reason, <clears throat> Q4 was the first time that we actually saw a pullback on the percentage of new car sales that were EVs, right? We had tapped around 8% through Q3 and fell into the 7.5 range in Q4. So I'm sure that plus the proliferation of models might be playing into it. But I'm, I'm, and before I jump over to you, uh, Elena, I'm curious from Ash, Liza, your perspective, the fact that all of this money and investments being thrown at these OEMs, whether it be a non-traditional like BYD or Sony Honda, Lucid, Tesla and others, or whether it be the traditionals, in the long run, is this a good thing because it's promoting greater awareness? Or is this a concern to you? It's a big commitment. It really is. And some parts of the market, um, worldwide, some markets are more receptive to EVs than others. In the US, mm -hmm. there's more mar uh, markets are receptive more to, to EVs than there are others. And, um, so to give you an example, uh, we are, while we are running about 50% and the Bay Area overall is probably give or take about that number, Why? right? We're, um, you know, Mercedes-Benz overall is less than 20%. Mm -hmm. But, but yeah. interestingly, 30% of their inventory is EVs. So that's... What? Oh yeah, for sure. That, that's definitely an issue as the Diana pointed out. The, uh, not only the um, units, the number of units in your inventory, but the dollar value of that, of that inventory, right? It's yeah. uh, even worse than 50%, right? So, sorry. Yes. So, Dave, it's, uh, and Liza, what about you? Do you think that's a good thing in the long run or you just had a concern? Well, I think there are a lot of great things about EVs for our industry and for our country. Um, but where my biggest concern is, is unlike other countries who have had success in growing into becoming a true EV market, we have a political landscape in this country that changes at least every four years. And our OEMs cannot make decisions based on four-year um, four year different political feelings around EVs. So what I'm very concerned about is that we've been going strong down this path. We have significant number of uh significant amount of production and number of models coming. We've been seeing growing um, consumer desire to own an EV with their number one concern being availability of charging infrastructure. If we have a change in legislative direction and we don't have future um, incentives for infrastructure, charging infrastructure, for tax credits, for things that have created some momentum and confidence from consumers in this country, 
I am really worried about what's going to happen with the production. And because the models aren't going to stop coming. The OEMs cannot. No. I mean, it is down this path. So that's my biggest worry, David, is how we handle the political headwinds when we, we can't necessarily mm. change the path as, as quickly as we can change the White House. Well, you know, it's so interesting you say that. Glenn Mercer, in earlier in his, uh, in his uh, panel discussion, mentioned something I thought was fascinating. This is the first car that draws a line across a political divide. Yeah, it's it, been politicized. So, so if you look at it, I think it's some astounding number, like 90% of EVs have been sold to the 10 largest Democratic counties. Uh, Republicans aren't buying EVs. When they do buy EVs, interestingly, they don't buy Teslas. They buy Fords, and they buy uh, uh, Fords and Rivians and a couple of others. But this, that's just strange, it's peculiar, I mean, but scary a little bit. It is scary because there's <laughs> nothing that has ever truly really been successful when there's a political tie to it, right? Because it just divides Great our point. country, it divides the population. So it very much worries me that EVs have have become political. Um, the other thing that I think is is important for the mainstream adoption of EVs is that it can't just be about whether it be a Democrat who's doing it for environmental reasons. There have to be mainstream buyers who see this as a really good economic decision, that they understand that it, it, maybe it's, it's a good business decision from an overall cost of ownership. Maybe it's a performance decision that they love the way the vehicle drives. And we are starting to see some of that change. We're seeing buyers who want it because they love the performance of an EV. We have, I'm, I'm not trying to get political here, but we have a sales associate who has a Nissan Leaf with a Trump sticker on the back. And he clearly tells me all the time, <laughs> I, I don't care about the environment, but you know what? I have two years. So I do, I do believe that we're starting to see yeah. other consumers outside of those who just are doing it for environmental reasons. Um, buying EVs. And that's a big turning point for our country, but we got to get it out of politics. That's, that's fascinating. Um, Elena, please chime in. So you've had some very interesting people on your show. And how long has your podcast been in existence? How long has your podcast been out? Uh, so a little Elena? over a year and a half now. All right. So the, of all the a people you've spoken to, now. so of all of the people you've spoken to about EVs, as much as you've dug into EVs, from a dealer's perspective, what is something that you've learned that you think would be of value to them as they go into 2024? Some dealers are very anti, uh, very anti, like I won't sell them, uh, which, um, it, you know, it's, it's everybody's prerogative. But if that percentage of the population is growing, you're essentially saying, I'm okay losing part of my sales. Some are hyper pro. And some are in areas like ash, where it's just part of the landscape. But what have you learned that you find interesting that you'd like to share with dealers? Well, I, I really, before I answer that question, I really do have to give Liza a shout out because as I was doing a little bit of research for this panel, I did find this random tweet from a very happy customer of Liza's. They were tweeting about, um, you know, how someone at Colonial Chevy helped them with their Chevy Spark. And here's the kicker. The tweet said, I passed two other local Chevy dealerships to come to this one because of their commitment to a future of electrification. Now, the wow. reason why, so shout out to Liza and her team because that's huge. But also too, when we're talking about EV adoption, the dealership is such a critical piece of this puzzle. And, you know, dealers like Ash, dealers like Liza, who are really like paying attention and, and putting in the extra work to make to make this this thing run. It's really, really noticed by um, uh, consumers. So. Um, OK, so go ahead. Keep going. Alina. Not sure. I'm still. Oh, okay. Sorry. I didn't know if I was, if I was out of the room or not. Um, so I just wanted to point that, that piece of it out the other. And so back to your original question about, um, an interesting guest. So I did have, um, so Matt Jones, he was formerly of Edmonds. He's now at true car. Um, and he made a comment that I thought was really, really super interesting. And he had said, look, we more than anything, need more of an EV action plan versus EV education. 
And to me, that was that was just such a mind blowing statement. So I'm like, wait, what do you mean? Because we're always saying, oh, we need more EV education. But really, his whole point was like, look, a lot of these EV buyers are already coming to the table. They're already really well informed. And instead, they need more of an action plan to see if this is a going to fit their lifestyle and their and their needs. And Liza is already really doing this right with her EV champions and for being able to really help in the fixed op side. So, but the differentiation though, between, yes, we have specialization already in the dealership, right? You might have a truck center, you have, you know, special finance. So if you go or going down this road of EV specialization, um, you know, I think where we can get a little bit stuck is going to be only just hanging up things on technical acumen instead of, how does this buyer want to actually transact with people? How does this buyer um, how does this buyer actually want to interact with your dealership? So I think that's where kind of the trend is is heading. But as soon as he had said, "Hey, we need a, an EV action plan," I was like, "Wow, that was holy moly! That was a great <laughs> a great comment." Yeah, it's a, it's very interesting. I'd love to know a little bit more about that. I want to be respectful of Diana because I think Diana. Head is uh, that entire room's going to explode if she doesn't get out of here in the next two minutes. And so, before you jump out, Diana, I I want to know if there's anything that you would share with dealers as they move into 2024. You mentioned the changes. We know these transitions that are happening. If I'm a dealer, I have multiple brands. I've got ICE. I've got EVs. We know that we've got about twice current ICE inventories up to unbelievably past 72 days on an industry basis, our EVs are up north of 125. And we certainly know, frankly, can't vilify EVs because we have way too many of those, but we also have way too many ice, frankly, for our current sales travel rate. But of everything that you've seen, everything you've learned, I mean, what would you, what would you recommend to a dealer? If there's one thing that they should do to help accelerate their ability to sell more EVs, what would it be? I think that when COVID happened, there was a changing of how people handle, handled marketing. And so uh, I would say for about three years, dealers really had a lot of advantages, meaning like there was low inventory on the ground. There were many of the dealers were asking for MSRP or even higher and being able to dictate those prices. And they shut off advertising. A lot of dealers across the U.S. basically said, I don't have to advertise anymore because I don't actually have all this inventory on the ground. So therefore, I'm going to shut off ads or I'm going to actually reduce the dollars that I'm actually spending in marketing. And I will say those days have now ended. Um, I will say that now competition is fierce and not only the OEMs are really having to start to put incentives back on vehicles, especially also on electric vehicles, because the competition, like you're saying, David, is over 120 day supply of electric vehicles on the ground without pricing being a factor right now, cars are going to stay on the lot longer. And so I worry about aging and the amount of inventory that people are actually mounting at this time with interest rates also at an all-time high and flooring, floor plan interest also being at very, very high numbers. We need to discount these vehicles and start advertising again, going back to the basics of what we used to do prior to 2020. And we've got to get going here because I just feel like competition is getting more and more fierce. And it's not that I believe in a D to C model, but I don't want to lose um, our U.S. economy and what we actually do with dealerships to direct to consumer models. I really want, because I've been in auto for the last 30 years, and I love the franchise models and I love auto dealers to actually stay intact. But in order to do this, we need to compete with all the D, D to C that are entering the market and trying to take market share. And so, uh, you know, the one major thing that I would say today is that if you have shut off marketing 
or reduced your budgets in marketing, you've got to start marketing again. Great. I appreciate that, Diana. I know that you got to jump off. So thank you for taking the time to join. I'm going to, I'm going to pitch this question to Liza, to you. Um, one of the huge differences in 2024, when you look at 2019, there's a number of massive differences. And one of them is in 2019, I found that the average uh, new car price was around 38,000 and OEMs were contributing 10.4% in consumer incentives to bring that price down essentially to closer to 34, right? Now the price is averaging 48.5 and OEMs are only contributing 4.4%. Well, that's 2,500 bucks roughly. So that's a big disparity. So, you know, Diana, I, I totally agree. Hey, you've got to spend the money on advertising. You've also got to be smart in who you're advertising to, what the message is, and it's got to be accountable and effective. But don't the OEM partners also play a significant role here is because that's, if there's the three legs of the stool, product being one, marketing being the other, the OEMs played a real important vital role uh, when we had 4.2 million cars in stock is they had dealer uh OEM to dealer incentives that promoted and allowed you to have a level of profitability that wouldn't be there without them. But face it, I mean, uh, operating income in 2018 was negative. 2019, 60 grand. You can't live on that. But it was those OEM partnership incentives. And then they also did the OEM to customer incentives. We don't have either one of those to the same degree. Is that is that something you expect to come back this year? And is that a critical piece in your mind? Well, I, I do expect it to come back. We're already seeing it come back where, you know, our, the incentives have been growing steadily over the last uh, 75 days. Um, what we're hearing from some OEMs that I think will be interesting to see how it plays out is they've invested, they've had to invest so much more money in bringing these EVs to market and the cost of the EVs. It, it is a higher cost for them than the, their traditional ICE vehicles. And so where that balancing point is, as far as how much money they can put into incentives on these vehicles versus what they could previously, um, I'm glad I'm not on the OEM side, to be honest. Oh, man, right? I, I wouldn't want to be Mary Barra or Jim Farley right now. Yeah, I think they've got a bit of a challenge ahead of them. Um, I think as a dealer, though, the things that we need to be focusing on is making sure that we continue to communicate with our OEMs so that we can balance production across different trim levels, making sure that we have a larger variety of price points. The last year, we have had nothing but typically high-end trim levels, the most expensive of each of the models that, that um, we currently represent. And then we've got to make sure that we're, we've got a ladder of our used vehicles that are they allow us options for consumers in every single price point. Um, one thing that I I that we're focused on and trying to make sure that we're doing right is understanding the used EV market. Um, with Tesla changing their pricing strategy all over the place, like 30,000, I think it's 30,000, right? Used Teslas into the market. It's like the wild, wild west on used EVs. And so our, I've found that our team seems to be working a little bit out of fear of uh, apprehension on how to properly appraise a used EV. Um, and then we also are trying to make sure everybody understands that it's not years and miles as far as what you utilize to appraise a used EV. And most managers that have been in our business for this for a long time are still approaching um, EV trades in the same way that we have with ICE vehicles. So I think I, yeah, the, the, the price point is in the hands of the OEMs. What we can control is communicating uh, as best we can to bring us some lower level trim models and then making sure that we've got great control of our used car inventory to have a variety of price points because affordability, I believe, is the number one issue uh, this year for, for consumers bigger than the EV issue. It's just simple affordability. I, I agree with you. I And I want to jump over to Ash before I do. Um, just a couple notes of interest. 30% um, of the used EVs in this country uh, are sold by 3% of the dealers. Um, you talk about dealers that are embracing and going in. This, it does not seem to be something that you can dabble in, uh, dip your toes in here and there. Number two, de there have been dealers out there that thanks to a, a tweet or two from Mr. Musk, have gotten their heads bashed in where they, you know, were in the EV right one day and the next month they were in it completely wrong, lost a lot of money and they decided I'm not playing anymore. I think that's a mistake um, to your point. I think, you know, we are so, I think in general with EVs, we're so early in still with all of this 
charging is going to get better, range is going to get better, reliability is going to get better. You know, if we go back to when cars were originally uh, created, probably those first five years were pretty rough, I'm guessing, um, when it came to reliability and, and range. So here we go all over again. But, I, I, you know, you've got people like um, uh, Jimmy Douglas, former Tesla executive who's come out with that portal plug, which something tells me that thing's going to grow in notoriety. And you've got people like right in, um, what I think it's Virginia, you've got a recharge, which is a EV only used car lot. And you've got Alex Lawrence who owns EV only in Salt Lake City. And those guys are selling some used EVs. So there is a market. And here's the crazy thing, Liza. They're more affordable. You know, Hertz, the CEO, mentioned this past week, hey, we're dumping out of a third of our EVs. We have 60,000. We're going to dump out of a third. By my count, that's 20,000. And according to Jimmy Douglas, there was only 21,000 EVs in the entire country, used cars available until that. So, you know, something tells me that's going to help affordability. But I went online and, you know, these used Model 3s at 25 grand, it's pretty hard to find a used car late model for 25 grand. These are 2022. So that's another thing that I think is an interesting layer where we may have uh, affordability issues. You're, you're absolutely correct. On the new car, some of these EVs on the used car side are an entirely different situation with affordability. And as Ash said, some of these leases are like the good old days with Audi and BMW to where you could buy you know, a, a car that should be a $600 lease. And because of subsidies, it's down to three fifty. dollars um, Thank you for that, Ash. I want to send it over to you for your last word. Um, a couple things. First of all, um, on the used EV side, are you guys equally engaged on used EVs? Do you have a, uh, uh, in, are you, is your used car directors leaning in on that or they tend to be sitting on the sidelines concerned about volatility? I will answer that question in one second here, but I need to ask Lisa to clarify. Liza. Uh, Liza, sorry. Um, I had to clarify a comment about um, some of these managers that are, some of these dealers are appraising EVs or valuing EVs the same way they did ICE vehicles. What do you mean by that? Um, instead of taking into account battery health and understanding that uh, miles on an EV aren't the only thing that uh, contribute to what its resale value is, a lot of it has to do, I, and being in a strong EV market, I'm sure you see this, you know, how did the person charge the vehicle? Are they using um, fast chargers all the time or are they just charging at night at home? Are they maxing out the charging? Or what sort of uh, weather conditions are they driving the vehicle in? And then, of course, testing the battery health itself to understand what percentage of the battery is still left. Um, for markets like my Stanton market, that's a rural market, th they just never run into anything like this. So they just look at it and say, OK, it's a two year old uh, Tesla with 45,000 miles. Let me put a number on it. So there are additional elements that we're just training our teams on that they need to be using when they're appraising a used EV versus an ICE vehicle. And that is true, because when I spoke to Alex Lawrence um, and John and, and Jimmy Douglas, the the parameter, what they look at to determine the value of an EV, there's probably a list of eight or 10 things that are so non-traditional. So I, it's, it, I think it's a valid point. Go ahead, Ash. Uh, no, it's, a, it's definitely a val valid point. Um, and I, uh, I tend to agree with you. Additionally, um, some manufacturers of the car are still under warranty and there is any indentation in the EV casing below, um, below the car that actually voiding the battery warranty. I think some of the high performance one like Porsche, I think if it's more than so many millimeters that indented in, then the warranty is void. So um, it's some of the things that you actually have to look at as well. So, but but uh, I think with, um, I think our own vehicles, our own manufacturer, we can probably um, value the health of the battery better than other makes, right? We don't really know how to value the health of those vehicles. I don't think there's standard tools in the market that actually allow you to do that. And, um, and that's probably one of the things that, um, if, if I was going to invent something new, that's probably what I would invent. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's something that can tell you the history of a battery. Hey, Ash, have you ever heard of a car? 
of the what? Oh, did you ever hear of a company called Rook? You're Early cutting Ash? out, Elena. Recurrent. Is that or, oh, I was going to say, I don't know if you can still hear me. Oh, you're, you're out there. Out. Re Recurrent. Yeah, that already exists. Recurrent. Wow. All right. I'll tell you what. Uh, well, you know, um, and, and Liza, you were saying something earlier, too, that I thought was very interesting, you know, um, and that is regardless of how anybody feels at the dealership level of EVs, of course, clients are becoming more interested. I think they are becoming more approachable. We've got Chevrolet coming out, you know, with more lower priced. Uh, one way or another, BYD is coming to town and they've got 20 something thousand dollar I think the lowest is 22, 23,000. I, I don't think that the traditional OEMs are going to stand by and uh, allow them to take that into the market. I think we're likely to see lower price. But is it true from your perspective? I think you were saying that that it's a good thing, that EVs are, are creating a, a higher level of passion than we've probably seen in quite some time. Some people are hyper pro passionate. Some people are anti, but it creates conversation. It keeps automobiles in the news literally almost every single day in yeah. some form or fashion. Is that a good thing? Well, they always say that all PR is good PR. So the fact that our industry is in the news every day only gets people thinking more about their transportation and the vehicle they have. And maybe they should consider a new vehicle, even if it's not an EV. They're seeing all this new technology come out. And we've been talking for years and we're worried that the next generation won't be as passionate about vehicles as the older generation. So I think some of this new technology can and is creating passion even in younger buyers. I also think a way that we can be utilizing this is in high schools and tech schools. We need to be attracting newer generations of technicians. And this is a whole different technology for them to learn to work on. And so we are seeing some excitement, not that tech schools have access to EVs. But we are seeing some younger people potentially considering um, that as a career path because they're so excited about the technology. And we need to foster that and continue to uh, drive it into the teenagers, into our tech schools, into our high schools, because our industry has lived off people being passionate and excited about vehicles for 100 years. I, I agree. And just to put an uh, icing or exclamation point on that. You know, uh, while many dealers say they struggle with getting Gen Zs or millennials in the stores, employees, you know, Tesla doesn't have that problem. Rivian doesn't have that problem because I think the fact that it's new technology, it's modern technology. So, you know, if you're a young person, young woman, young man, and you get into a tech school and you learn EVs, this is something that's not going anywhere for the next 30, 40 or 50 years. It's going to get more fun, more interesting, more complex. And with that usually comes more opportunities and more income. So I love that you said that. Liza, I know that you're at a hard stop. So I want to thank you for joining as well. And I'm going to go ahead and wrap up with Ash and with Elena. Elena, um, I just want to know what your parting shot is. Uh, what else would you say that you think would be of value to dealers out there um, as they move further into 2024 um, in being able to really understand this different buyer, this how to approach a different market. Now, Ash said, and Liza said to a degree, in many ways, they're the same. They want the same things. They're looking for a car that's going to solve a need, and they would like to have a transparent, uh, you know, buying approach, uh, buying experience. Of course, they want a great ownership experience. But what would you say that you've learned from anybody else that you've interviewed that you think would be of value to dealers. Yeah, absolutely. And also I want to preface this too by, you know, CES is now the new auto show, right? And that's what's really cool and exciting about the automotive technology that's coming out there, right? So uh, don't sleep on CES, right? I, I, Highly recommend everybody that's in automotive retail. You've probably been seeing some of the headlines coming out of that show from Las Vegas last week. So don't sleep on CES. The other, um, the other, I guess, kind of parting uh, thought or final thought I would really have is speaking of CES. So I saw a live stream of uh, so the CTO of Walmart was doing a keynote presentation. He said something that really struck me, and it really does 
kind of fit in together with what's happening with automotive retail and EVs. And he said, you know, the experiences of the future, they're going to be even more seamless, even more delightful, even more intelligent and more connected from discovery to purchase to delivery. And I thought, wow, isn't that what we're all trying to achieve? Like this nirvana of automotive retail and you know, I, uh, you know, it's really similar to almost the thoughts that uh, Brian Benstock is always talking about from Paragon Honda. He's always saying, I'm not competing with the dealer down the street. I'm competing with Apple. I'm competing with Amazon. I'm competing, I'm competing with Google. So again, thinking about how this EV buyer wants to transact, there is a um, uh, EY, um, uh, micro uh, micro mobility consumer index that just uh, got released. Ninety percent of EV buyers are looking online, are wanting to use online tools. So again, it's I don't want to say it's more of the same, but it's more of the same times a thousand, right? Yeah. So really looking into what is that curated curated experience, and what does that mean um, oh. for folks that are EV curious. I know you had uh, John Foley from Recharge, and he has this key word. He always says EV curious. I said, that's such a great term because I feel that we all are a little bit EV curious. Well, I think, you know, I think that we're, um, I think the, it's interesting. Anytime you have tech, whether it's, you know, blockchain, maybe to a lesser degree, but um, AI, for example, or, you know, EVs, anything that's tech forward, is not only getting a lot of airplay and attention in the media, but I think in the minds of young people and the minds of people everywhere. I think it's fascinating the things. And Ash, did you go to CES? No, I I didn't. I um I have a lot of stuff uh, happening right now and uh, try <laughs> to travel, but uh, I am gonna go to, just a little uh, bit. <laughs> I'm gonna try. I'm I'm gonna try to make an ADA, so we'll see. If there is oh, hopefully I'll, I'll be there. Hopefully I see you there uh, for sure. But CES was interesting. On one hand, you had Ford, GM, Toyota, and Stellantis all pulled out late. Yeah. And, you know, is that because they have too many uh, things in the front burner? Is that because they're pulling back on on investment and this is not the time uh, to do to do that? I don't know. You also had a virtually none and maybe zero charging companies that had been there in years past, they were not represented at all this year. That's kind of interesting. Well, is, you know, is in general are having a hard time in the marketplace. They're, they're, they're not, they're, they're, it's costing them a lot. Like Volta? Huh? You're talking about country uh, companies like Volta? Yeah, exactly. They're, they're all, it's costing them a lot more to maintain these chargers than they've probably anticipated or hoped for. And it's becoming more of a... Um, and may, uh, for them, a maintenance nightmare, probably, my guess. I, I would also think, if you think about it, you put the charger in and you're probably paying something for that space, those parking spaces at baseline from the from the malls or wherever you locate it. In addition, your, your bills, kind of like a dealer, when we wake up on the first of the month, those expenses are coming, man. It doesn't matter if there's a snowstorm, they're coming. Hurricane, they're coming. Pandemic, they're coming. State wants to close down the store for a month. Expenses don't stop. Well, that the, that energy expense, maintenance expense, it shows up every day, 30 days a month, but the advertiser may not, right? So I don't know what their business model is as far as what it takes in advertising revenue to break even, but sure seems like it could be a, a relatively challenging business model. And I'm guessing either again, I don't know if that's an an investment pullback, if it's a a move to save on cash burn, because CES is about as expensive as it gets. I don't know, but at the same time, there was no shortage of tech, auto related tech, uh, all the way up to and including obviously the ever present flying car, which yeah. at some point is going to make its uh, presence known. Um, Ash, what would you say as a party shot from your perspective? And I want you to think about it two through two lenses, through a what you're a West Coast dealer who's dealing with the reality that you just have this onslaught of EVs, like there is no choice. You're either going to participate and figure out how to do it better than most or better than anybody to 
optimize profitability and opportunities to dealers that are not in your situation. So it's almost like you're the Norway, right? You're the Amsterdam or Norway of the United States. Like it's, this is coming. And what would you tell dealers, you know, as they continue to see, maybe they're at 2% now, maybe they're at 10% now, but you know, it's coming. What would you tell them as a recommendation going into 2024? So I tell a lot of my colleagues in 20 groups and uh, meetings and so forth and so on from across different parts of the country. And th they always pick on San Francisco for whatever it may be. Maybe <laughs> but, well, it's a socialist country that maybe is that for, I don't know. You know, new, new, new labor laws, new minimum pay, new, you know, like, um, you know um, unbelievable sick pay, that type of thing. And they, uh, and I, and I always remind them of this. Okay, whatever happened in San Francisco, <laughs> it's like the movie premiere. Okay, it's coming to <laughs> me and you very soon. With no smoking, you know, um, you know, one of the first cities in the world to have no smoking policies in bars, right? And people yeah. said, "What do you mean you can't smoke in bars, right?" And um, and and now that's just the norm, right? Worldwide, pretty much, right? So. Um, so, um, again, uh, to your point, David, it is coming. Um, it may slow down a little bit if we have a change in administration, maybe. Uh, but the manufacturers had to, make a, had to make a call a few years back on which way to go, and they decided to spend all the money on EVs. I think it's going to be very challenging times for manufacturers, to be honest with you. And the ones that can pivot back to more of a hybrid, and they also offer... Um, other solutions in the ice space, you know, I think they're going to do well. Uh, ones that are 100% EVs, I'm going to see a lot of uh, margin challenge. I mean, uh, Tesla is facing huge margin challenges right now, right? Mm -hmm. They seem to, to to do well with other with other revenue sources, whether it's uh, you know carbon credits or letting other manufacturers use their charging network or or whatever it may be. So, but there's going to be a lot of disruption in the landscape as you see it today. I believe in EV manufacturers, if not only EV, and um, <clears throat> uh, dealers are just going to have to learn how to sell them. And because um, because everybody, if everybody is thinking about EV, I don't really care where they're at. They're, they're thinking about it, and then they're saying, "No, it's not for me." But at least they're thinking about it. At some point, they're going to say. You know what? Let me try one. And maybe it's not my 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 all my only car, but it's probably my my almost everyday car. You know, it's funny you say that, Ash, because <clears throat> there's been a number of uh, you know research <clears throat> studies and polls, and every one of them seems to come out about the same. Roughly, somewhere between forty and fifty percent of people are saying that I would consider. Uh, an EV. Now, just a couple of years ago, it was 80 something percent. Now it's 60 something percent, according to S&P Global. But many other studies are citing 40, 45, 50 percent. Doesn't matter what the number is. Think about this for anybody out there. If 8 percent of our cars that we sold in last year in 2023 were EVs, but 40 or 50 percent were thinking about it, it just seems to Ash's point that as that number either stays there or grows, it's going to naturally pull that sales number up. Don't you think, Ash? Yeah, affordability and and faith in the charging network. That's really mm -hmm. what it's going to be. So a manufacturer is going to have to figure out a, a way how to build these these vehicles cheaper, less expensive, how to the battery, how, uh, battery technology needs to catch up and pricing on batteries needs to drop. But, um, and... Um, miles per kilowatt, right, range. I think that's really important. So um, if they can, you know, they'll get all the stuff together at some point. And, uh, but I think that the future is going to be very interesting. I'm also, to couple that with just a comment that may not be EV, but it's definitely disruptive, is the, the whole idea of the um, software ecosystem for every car manufacturer, right? So every one of them is building their OS, and every one of them hoping to sell you 30, 40% of the price of the car for over on over the air. And that means that all these options are, are standard built in the car. You just have to activate them and pay for them. And um, 
which may create another problem. And, you know, like uh, jailbreaking cars. I mean, that may be <laughs> It's happened already. Yeah, People exactly. have figured out how to access yeah. Tesla's upsells. So, uh, I look forward to seeing how this all plays out, to be honest with you, David. Yeah, I think that you'd have to echo what Liza said. Uh, you know, glad I'm not an OEM. Uh, whatever challenges we may have at the dealer level, I promise it's not what it is at the OEM level. That's for sure. I think personally, I think Ash, they were checkmated. They didn't have a choice. Uh, you put the political, uh, divide aside, you know, when you see your share start to erode to Tesla, to Rivian, to Lucid, to Polestar, even if it's death by a thousand paper cuts, it doesn't matter at what point are you going to say, I'm going to stand still here. Sure or I have to invest to try to protect my territory. You know, the big three owned 70 something percent uh, before um, Datsun and Toyota and Honda came to town and we know where they exist today. And, you know, for very good reason, Mercedes Benz was a, a brand that you, you know, uh, Mercedes had to talk dealers, as you know, into taking the brand in the sixties and look what it's become. Uh, Hyundai came out with a 4995 car that was, you know, most people thought was slightly more uh, safer than a grocery cart. Look where it is today. It's a giant. Um, so, you know, I don't think they had a choice, but for dealers, uh, ironically, we just have to, to your point, know that it's coming and figure out uh, to the best of your ability, how to embrace it, leverage it and optimize it. I agree and with you. And let's not discount the Chinese competition. I, I think I think 2025 changes everything. BYD and eight eight other EV companies, they already have a solid state battery. They already have a 400 mile range car that only costs 30 grand. They already have models in the 20s. Uh, they already have everything from a premium high performance down to an SUV and a minivan. So they're going to be formidable. And I, I think that it's going to cause everybody to raise their game. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but there is 60 EV manufacturers in China. Unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, their audience is dwindling. So they're coming here uh, to make money and expand their companies. They're coming here. Elena, what's your last thought as we wrap up? Well, well you know what? I uh, To Ash, what he had mentioned at the very beginning early on uh, when we hit record, we had mentioned about uh, the the leases that were coming through for EVs, and that just reminds me of just the iPhone analogy, right? Like you lease your like you don't pay all up front for your iPhone, right? And so because the technology, you know that there's going to be another what are we up to iPhone like sixteen now, 15. right? We fifteen where well, we're going to be up to sixteen at some point, and we know that October, the, te the technology. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know that the technology is going to be constantly changing, constantly improving, right? So that's, you know, what Ash was saying about lease is just, it makes so much sense. And again, I know, David, you and I had talked about this briefly earlier about um, like that micro lease uh, subscription mechanism, although they were a miserable failure under <laughs> any other uh, kind of, uh, there were quite a lot of OEM subscription programs that completely failed and bombed. But I think with uh, with with EVs coming or EVs are now here, I think it is kind of uh, an interesting and creative way or mechanism to get people to experience an EV, maybe a little bit more affordably. Dealers can then write down the cost of the EV. So I think there's a lot of interesting, cool things happening in that space. Um, although, you know, it doesn't have a great track record. So again, it does not, it does, it does not. not. And it in states, in record. states, in states like ashes, where you've got to pay 10 plus percent sales tax up front and light and DMV, that's a hard road to hoe, but there's other markets to where that's not a, not a, not a problem, not a barrier. So the word of the day, obviously is I, I think is just being open-minded uh, being willing to look at things from a different perspective and probably most importantly, look at things through the lens of your client. If that's what they want, if that's what they're interested in, you're either going to jump on that side of the line or you're going to be on the wrong side of the line. So it's going to be an interesting year. I agree with Ash. I think everything shifts when the Chinese come to town. And by the way, BYD is going through a dealer network. Uh, VinFast is going through a dealer network. They're, they know not to go to direct consumer. Um, 
And I think that's going to shift the landscape massively. But for now, for this year, 2024, it's really about just figuring out how do I effectively sales, sell and market EVs to the best of our ability. Ash, thank you for taking the time to join. Thank it means a lot. I, I always you. appreciate your perspectives. Elena, wonderful to see you again. Thank you for offering your perspective as well. Keep in touch or continue to listen to your uh, podcast. And we want to, again, thank Diana Lee and Liza, who had to jump off because both had very pressing meetings to jump into, and we appreciate them participating as well. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. And we will look forward to seeing you again on the next session. Thank you. Bye.